or you can have a combination. But again, this is based on the relationship of the maxilla to the mandible, assuming that the maxilla is in the correct position to cranial base. So what do I mean by that? If I draw my anterior arc and the pogonian point is on that, but the maxilla is way back, that is what I call a skeletal 2A, maxillary deficient. That patient, as part of their class 2 correction, will require face mask therapy, which normally you reserve for a class 3 patient. Right? If I draw that anterior arc and the maxilla is on that arc, A and S, but B point or pagonian is well behind the anterior arc, that is a skeletal 2B. That treatment is promoting the mandible to come forward. Okay? The last skeletal or class is class three and again you can have three types of class three skeletal 3a skeletal 3b skeletal 3c what does that mean again the most common skeletal three is a maxillary deficient class three patient which means that their maxilla is hypoplastic is retronathic and that patient when you draw their anterior arc will have their mandible on the arc but the maxilla set back so the treatment of that patient is to treat early they will probably require a face mask now i don't know whether they require expansion because that is related to the width of their maxilla i'm at this stage looking at the position of the maxilla all right now they could be 3B, what does that mean? It means that the maxilla is where it should be, but their mandible is too big. Normally that is a genetic tendency. And that's a patient you normally would not touch until their mandible stops growing, and that's a patient that normally will require orthognathic surgery. Yeah? Or type 3C is a combination, retrusive maxilla, increased mandible. So, so far we have three classifications we have skeletal or class one, two, or three. And in subdivision, we have skeletal one, but we have skeletal two ABC, skeletal three ABC. Right, we're on, on board? Now let's go to the teeth. The division, and whenever you hear the word division, I'm talking teeth. Another word for division, inter-incisal angle which is the angle between the upper and lower incisor. So in an ideal case, the interincisal angle is about 135 degrees. That's what we call division one, right? We measure the angle of the upper incisor for a number of reasons. As you get into more advanced courses, I use the term TORQ, T-O-R-Q-U-E. That is basically another name for the um, inclination of the incisor. So an under-torqued incisor is what we call division two. A procline incisor is what we call division three. And you could have an ideal interincisal angle based on the fact that the upper incisor is adequately torqued. Now, depending on what you use, and most of you are used to Truett's classification, so we'll stick with that. He uses the angle of the upper incisor to Frankfurt horizontal. And in an ideal torque class, oh, sorry, division one, you would have 115 degrees as your incisor angle which would mean that the upper to the lower would be roughly 130 to 135. If a case is under -taught, which is very common in the UK, the most common malocclusion in the UK is division two, skeletal two, 
malocclusion. Division two means that the upper incisors are actually upright or were still retroclined. How do we measure that? Well, obviously from our initial x-ray, but in your country, I know that the powers of darkness are all scared about um, uh, taking too many x-rays, even though I will show you the evidence-based research in course two that shows you the x-rays that I'm requiring um, in your orthodontic diagnosis um, are about the equivalent on your patient um, flying from here to the United States as far as um, uh, background radiation of millisieverts. So I'm sure the powers of darkness don't tell you to warn your patients not to have more than one overseas trip a year because it's very dangerous for them. Yeah? Um, and I just want you to get some evidence-based sense in what you're doing. I require from you a lateral CEF um, on at least two occasions. In my practice, I do three lateral CEFs. One before I start, one before I finish, and one as my long-term retention record to check stability. Now, I'm not asking for the third one for you. I use it because medical legally I think it's important, um, also for teaching. Um, but for you, you definitely need one to diagnose and you also need one before you finish the case. And I'll explain to you um, how you can get that. Basically, in Australia now, in the United States, in Canada, in what I call civilised countries, yeah, um, everyone uses cone beam technology, CBCT. So we no longer take a lateral CEF or a frontal, or a TMJ view, or an OPG, or even bite wings. The quality of CBCT is so good now, one patient facial scan can give you all that data. Yeah? So I don't know your regulations in this country, but I would suggest that if you're investing in technology in your practice, you invest in good quality cone beam CT in your office. So what I'm willing to accept from you is a cone beam view reconstructed, and I'll go through that in a minute. Or if you don't have cone beam, I expect a digital standard CEF OPG frontal. For certain patients who have a history of TMD or have intracapsular disorders, I would like an MRI. Not a transcranial, total waste of time and money. An MRI off the joint, but not for every patient. For patients who have a history of periodontal disease, I would expect a full mouth periapical series and a perio charting. So there's certain things that are optional based on the problem, such as TMD, perio, but there's certain things that are essential for every patient, and that is by age seven, I need these views for diagnosis. And you'll see why as we go along. Now, if you don't want to take too many x-rays and you want to start measuring torque, this will be a good investment. This is actually made in the UK. It's made um, by a company called OrthoCare. And it's basically a torque meter. And it allows you, without an x-ray, to put this on your patient clinically. It gives you a grid, and that grid corresponds to a degree. Right? So if you want to check that you have adequate torque, Normally, you'd have to take a lateral CEF. Um, alternatively, you can use this uh, at any stage and you can then determine. Now, this is torque, though, to occlusal plane. So the reading will be different to torque or inclination to cranial base. And we're going to go through these things. But that is a good investment for you, particularly when it comes to case finishing. Now, what is this malocclusion? This is a malocclusion where the upper incisors are under -talked. So what do you think that has on the dental division? That causes the dental division to increase. So we're now talking about an interincisal angle that's going to be greater than 140. All right? And the goal of treatment in a patient like this is to correct the dental division from division two to division one. Here's another division. 
This is a division that Angle didn't even classify. Why? Because where Angle was practicing, there really wasn't too much by max. Now, I hate the term bimaxillary protrusion. Because, and it's used commonly in specialist circles. Unless you were born in Chernobyl, you only have one maxilla, okay? You have bidental protrusion, which means your teeth are thing, or you can have biskeletal protrusion. A lot of your Afro-Caribbean type patients, when you do their tracing, their maxilla and their mandible will be forward of that arc because that's their common racial type, right? Why is division three common? It's common in tongue thrust. It's common in um, class three because the upper incisors tend to procline to compensate for the large mandible. It's common in certain racial types, Chinese, um, uh, Indian backslash Indian Asian type, Spanish Hispanic you know, uh, type deals. It's common for them to be division three, all right? And then we open up the whole Pandora's box that people who are division three want to be division one. Why? Because people want to have Caucasian norms. I travel around the world. I've lectured in 62 countries. Every time I go from the airport to my hotel, you pass billboards. And the billboards, even though they might have you know, that racial type model, it's not a true representation of that population. It's normally an anglicized model. Do you know what I'm saying? So in other words, you know, like a Cosby kid. Um, they're kind of black, but they're not really true Negroid. Because the world, whether you're in um, um, South America or in Europe, wants to have certain criteria. Yeah, and that's why even though I might get a patient who's Chinese class one, division three, and I say, you know, congratulations, you are normal, Mr. Wu, right? But Mr. Wu wants to have teeth like Mr. Smith, yeah? And I have to say, well, Mr. Wu, um, I'm gonna have to take teeth out here and the stability is not gonna be good because Mr. Wu, your child has a speech pattern and a tongue pattern that's used to this. So if I do that, the guarantee is that you need to have a fixed lingual wire, upper and lower, between five to five. Because the day I take your braces off, your kid's gonna go back to looking like that. So these are the sort of things that we're gonna learn. So, so far, just so we haven't lost people, we have nine malocclusions. Three dental, three skeletal. So you can be dental division two, on a skeletal one, two, or three base. Understand each other? But to be more accurate, I would like you to say, Dr. Mahoney, I have a dental division two patient on a skeletal two base, which is maxillary deficient. So division two, skeletal two A, right? Skeletal class, same. Interincisal lang division, same. So far we have nine. How many more uh, is that compared to angle? It's already five more. Yep, but we haven't finished.